So I know those of you here, here la- who were here last week are eager to hear the uh, rest of the story. I, I was gone last week and told you about uh, my, my, that I was going to this conference and that I was, had a, a box shipped and I told you how it would go, right? Remember, do you remember that? So you came this morning to hear that, didn't you? Well, guess what? You're not going to hear it today. No, no, you'll hear it next week. So you come back next week. Because today I, I, today I decided to engage in a little bit of self-care, which means I was gone all last week, got home Friday evening, and thought I would like the day off this morning. So I have today off, although I'm physically here. I'm not going to give our talk today. I invited a dear, dear friend and colleague of mine to offer our spiritual lesson this morning, so I get to sit back and be nourished just like you do. But I promise to bring you up to date on the conference and the box next week, so be sure to be here for that. But this morning, I want to introduce you to someone who you may already know, you may know a lot about her, Reverend Sally Robbins, but I want to give you a few pieces of information that you may not know. What you may know is that Reverend Sally is an accomplished speaker, writer, and teacher. But did you know that at the age of 18, she won an Olympic gold medal in swimming? She competed in the 1976 Olympics, winning gold for the 100-meter butterfly. Did you know that Reverend Sally then became a world-class model, gracing runways all over the world? She modeled for the likes of Halston, Dior, and Chanel. The pinnacle of her modeling career was when she was selected to be on the cover of the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition. Woo-hoo! Utilizing her, her strength in front of the camera, Reverend Sally then became an Emmy Award-winning news reporter and an anchor. She was best known for her live coverage of an air disaster in Florida, which was aired nationally. After a successful career in television, the ministry called Reverend Sally. She began her next career, serving as senior minister at three churches, most recently at New Vision Center for Spiritual Living. After leaving New Vision a year and a half ago, Reverend Sally wrote a best-selling book, which shot to number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Today, Reverend Sally is happily married to her wonderful husband of 25 years, and she and her husband have 15 beautiful children. Despite her busy schedule, she still manages to have a delicious home-cooked meal on the table every night for her family. Would you please give me a warm CLF welcome for Reverend Sally Robbins. Okay, you know that wasn't true, right? I'll autograph later, yes, yes. Uh, Well, you know, it it actually, during the first service, I kept hearing people go, oh, wow, ooh, and I thought, they're not getting it, that it's a joke. I was starting to get really worried, but um, what what was it, if you did catch on? The swimsuit edition, was that, did you catch on? How about that I had 15 kids and I had a home-cooked meal? Okay. I figured somebody would catch up along the way that maybe, just maybe, that all wasn't true. Well, here's the real deal. I was a swimmer. I never made it to the Olympics, but I was a swimmer. And I was a news reporter. Here's a picture of me 38 years ago at the tender age of 20. Oh, to be 20 again. Yet, uh, if I could speak to this young lady, I would say, you thought you knew it all. Didn't we think all thought we knew it all when we were 20 years old? And there's still so much to learn. But I was a reporter and an anchor, and I did cover an air disaster that was um, the interview that I did for, um, for this story was actually picked up by a then-fledgling organization. They'd been around for maybe only a year or two at that time called CNN. Um, so, uh, And I'm still working on the best-selling book, so... Hold on, but I do not have 15 children, thank goodness. Whew, don't have the time for that. Um, But my point in that introduction is this. Imagine back to the time, maybe you were 20, maybe you were, maybe it was more recent than that, when you were full of dreams, when you were full of ideas and empowered living, that you thought anything was possible. Do you remember that? 
And somewhere along the line, we might have put some of those dreams up on the shelf. Maybe now and then we take them off, dust them off. But this morning, I'm actually going to help us revisit. Revisit the idea that belief is the ruling part of our lives that determines the outcome that happens in our lives. Would you agree with that? You know, Emmett Fox, the the eminent sage, said, when you want more love in your life, get back to the basics. When you want more prosperity in your life, get back to the basics. And so we're getting back to the basics this morning. And so the title of my talk is, have you... Take your vitamin B, which is basic, but it stands for belief. Belief is that is what we are going to talk about this morning, because that is the cornerstone, is it not, of our teaching, that it all begins with belief from the reading that Dr. Michelle shared this morning, that we have within us the capability to dream big dreams if we simply dare and then hold on to that. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Many times new, newcomers get this immediately. Uh, the ministers in the room, those who have taught, are, can acknowledge that many times we'll teach the, the first class, the, the fundamental class, foundations class, and students get so excited because they've never heard some of these empowering ideas, and they go, oh, I get it, I want that, I want that. And they start producing miracles in their lives, and yet those of us who've been around for a while, we might forget that, oh yeah, that... There is an empowered life that we can live. And so we need to come back to basics again and again and again. That belief truly is that, that kernel that we have to have. It has to start with us. And we have to acknowledge that belief, if we have a belief that isn't working for us, guess what we get to do? We get to change it. We don't have to stick with that which is no longer serving us. So today being Father's Day... We acknowledge the masculine energy, the masculine energy which we all have, that is all encompassed within us. And Dr. Michelle's theme this month is engaging, embracing, and empowering life. Those are all the masculine. That is what we do to empower ourselves, empower this world. We have the creative power within us to create the blueprint of the life of our dreams if we simply dare. So, let's talk about creativity, because belief comes with creativity, does it not? We have to create that in our minds, the mental equivalent of what we want. And so, I want to tell you first about a story going back to World War II. I heard about a very special unit that the military came up with, and they actually recruited men from ad agencies and art schools and other other venues where creativity was the focus. And so they, they, created, they, they recruited these men, there were about 1,100 of them, and it was popularly known as the Ghost Army because what they did was they decided they were going to create a little deception. And so they put together some dummy tanks. These were blow-up tanks that they could easily transport to anywhere they wanted. And they would create and stage what looked like when plane, the German planes flew overhead, it looked like it was a giant battalion. As a matter of fact, it was so convincing that as they worked, th- you know, put, set these up, they actually created, oh, here's, here's a picture of four guys holding up the tank that they've blown up. They, they even hung out clothes on a clothesline to make it look like there were troops that were there and set up. In addition to these visual props, they also set up huge loudspeakers, and they had actors read into the loudspeakers things that were um, trans, what, what would have been transmissions of troop movement so that the Germans were fooled immensely. They were... They used these props not once, not twice, but 21 times. And according to Jack Neese, who is the author of Ghost Army of World War II, the Germans never caught on. (coughs) He said, as a matter of fact, it made the Germans think that these 1,100 men in this unit were a unit of 30,000 men. That's remarkable. (coughs) He says they were so successful 
that get this sometimes a german army that was in the area would surrender to them it was that that successful so what we understand about this is they took belief which we know then becomes perception and what does then perception become reality right so this was a wonderful i'd never heard of this this troop before and it was a wonderful way for me to think wow how do they create belief so convincingly and where can we do that in our lives as well here's someone else who is recently in the news who i think was probably one of the greatest promoters of vitamin b belief that would ever lived and his name is muhammad ali and here he comes here he comes next there we go he said i am the greatest i said that even before that i knew that i was now is that not religious science yes. that is someone who decided who he was in the midst of what other people told him he was and he was not allowing anyone to convince him otherwise of the belief that he was the greatest and he was truly a religious scientist he was a practicing muslim but dr ernest holmes said you can be a baptist and a religious scientist you can be anything in a religious scientist what we're doing is we're creating the model of creating the mental equivalent of something greater than we think we are and so the muhammad ali i think embodied probably better than most the idea of the mental equivalent and so on the next slide he says impossible is just a big word thrown around by small men who find it easier to live in the world they've been given than to explore the power they have to change it there's the empowerment that he he understood and he used that again and again and again I I have such admiration for this man who in later life was given a diagnosis of a a disease that really took a lot of his faculties away but did he let that stop him? No. He kept going. And it, his memorial service was a great tribute to him that not only did he have the Muslim clerics but he had pastors and and priests from every religion and he had all faiths represented there and he was represented in he wrote his own funeral service too which i thought was great he said this is who i want and this is what they're going to say and so he was able to bring together people from all walks of life and all faiths truly a man who taught that love is the highest and so what can we learn that the belief that this man had and that he embodied each and every day he practiced this each and every day is how we too get to live I'm going to ask to see if you know who this next guy is. Oh, before I get to that. <laughs> and who is that? Dr. Ernest Holmes said this. We are surrounded by intelligent law which does unto each as he believes it is measured out out to us according to our measuring. We call this the law of mental equivalence how much life can any man experience say this together as much as he can embody see this is it it's not just that ministers and practitioners we don't have a corner on this we don't have we have wonderful training that helps us remember this but yet what he is saying here is that if you have the faith of a mustard seed you too can understand that you have the empowerment ability to take on the belief that you choose in your life this is something that i think many of us forget easily isn't it especially when we have weeks like the last week when we get caught up in world events that help us to think small again and so we come back to the basics we come back and get our vitamin b that our beliefs are that love is all there is even when someone forgets that and so you and i have the capability to step into a place of empowerment again and again and again even when people around us have forgotten 
So now I get to ask you, do you know who this is? Next slide, John. Thank you. There we go. Who's that? Some of you who might be a little bit on the elder side, my, son, my age. Alan Funt. Alan Funt. And what was his TV show? Candid Camera. That's right. That's right. And so I bring him up because they did a lot of great pranks, didn't they? They had really funny stuff. And in 1963 he decided that they were going to play a prank on innocent motorists motorists going down a road. It was a road that went into, that separated one state from the state of Delaware. And he got a guy who had an official-looking uniform on and another guy that had a clipboard, and they put up this sign that said, Delaware closed today. And these motorists would drive up, and they would stop him, the, and the motorist would say, why can't I go in? And the, the official-looking guy would say, well, I'm sorry, but the state is closed today for repairs. <laughs> or there's too many people already in, New Jer- in, in, in Delaware. So the, Maryland's over here to the left, and New Jersey's on the right. You're happy to, you know, you can go to either of those states. But Delaware is closed. And some people got really outraged that they couldn't go into Delaware. They, well, my, I live right over there. And... <laughs> and the, the official-looking man said, well, you can come back at midnight because more people will have gone by then, and we can let you in at that point. And at that point, some people said, okay, and they backed up their car, and they turned around. Now they caught them before they left. But I love this story because one of the women that they stopped, she was a little aggravated at first, and so we see her on this next slide. She actually said, what do you mean I can't go into, De- into Delaware? I always go into Delaware. And then she said, oh, I can go into New Jersey? Okay, I'll go to New Jersey. So she got in her car and she zipped off to New Jersey. How many times, how many times have we been told that Delaware is closed? In some form in our lives. How many times have we been told that a dream that we might have is closed? Closed to us anyway. How many times have we bought into the idea that something is off limits, that something's beyond our grasp, that we're not capable of reaching that, and we've bought into that Delaware is closed? It's a wonderful reminder to us that many times we have to bring up our beliefs for inspection sometimes, would you agree, and just go, wait a minute, I'm not sure that that really is true. And just like Candy Camera pulled a prank on these people, maybe life is pulling a prank on me if I buy into something when the truth really is nothing is closed. Nothing is out of my grasp. Nothing is unavailable to me because I'm going to know the truth that the universe is always conspiring for my good. Can I get an amen to that? You have within you that power right now. Simply to say, I'm not buying that Delaware is closed or whatever is closed off to me. I get to choose. I get to choose a new belief today. Greg Braden stood in this room just a couple weeks ago, and he said something that still gives me goosebumps when I say it. He said, you were wired for magnificence. You were wired for magnificence and nothing less. And so when, we, when I heard that, it was like, oh, that's my going back to the basics. Because don't we forget that sometimes? We think we're here just to plod through our ordinary, everyday lives. And yet, each one of us has that germ of the seed inside of us that is so capable of magnificence if we simply allow that to be birthed into expression. There is unlimited potential. And you are creating all the time, whether you know it or not. Did you know that? You're creating all the time. In his wonderful book, The Spontaneous Healing of Belief, Greg Braden said this, whether our attention is focused on a quantum particle during a laboratory experiment or anything else, from the healing of our bodies to the success of our careers and relationships, we have expectations and beliefs about what we are watching. So in other words, We can't be simple bystanders in anything. We're always participating 
We're always participating in the intentions and the belief that we have about what is to happen with anything in our world. Our belief determines our self-imposed limits. So he's reminding us, it's not that we don't have beliefs, it's that our beliefs might be too limited. They might be a little small. Are we daring to dream big, huge? Hey House, I'm on their email list. I love how things just come, drop into my email box sometimes when I'm writing a, for a topic for the week. And they sent out a series of videos by Bruce Lipton, who Greg Braden reminded us he's really good friends with him because, of course, many of the things that they both teach are much aligned. And Bruce Lipton wrote this wonderful book called The Biology of Belief. And in this video series that was released this week by Hay House, he talked about the myth of genes, our genetic code, our genetic makeup. Because if you were like me in science in eighth grade or whatever grade it was, they said, you get a set of genes and that's it. That's what you're born with, and that's what you live with. And depending upon what your forefathers, your, your parents, your grandparents, and, and that lineage that you have, that determines your genetic makeup as well. But Bruce Lipton, in this video series, said that that's hogwash. That's not the way it really works. Because the popular belief that we inherit genes is actually being proven again and again that that is not correct. He says, as a scientist, he started to challenge this years ago. He actually took a cell, and he took the nucleus of the cell out, and he was examining that nucleus. And what he discovered was, if you were part of the Greg Braden experience a couple weeks ago, you won't be surprised by this, that that nucleus of the cell has a brain. It has the wisdom, the um, internal... Um, ability to think and to act upon that which is being acted upon it. And so he realized that your thoughts, your intentions, have as much to do with anything because your cells, the nucleus of your cells and this brain that's in it, is reacting exactly to that. You change your biology when you change your thoughts. What's the, the phrase that we use in science of mind? Change your thinking, change your life. And that's all that's now science is backing up. They're proving it again and again. So Bruce Lipton went on to say in this video that there is no gene that causes cancer, which was a controversial thing back when he first started saying it. He actually got kicked out of a few places for saying things like that. But now they've proven it, that genes are not causing cancer, but they are associated with cancer. He says there's the BRCA1 gene, which is believed by most traditional doctors to cause breast cancer. So the BRCA1 uh, gene, they, they can test women for that, and if they find it, some women have gone to great lengths even having mastectomies so that they don't get breast cancer. But what he said was that what they have discovered is that only 50% of the women that have the BRCA1 gene actually get cancer. And traditional doctors are mystified by this. They can't understand why. How come it's not working in, in all these cases? What are these other 50% of the women doing? And Bruce Lipton says this, that the conclusion is that lifestyle, beliefs, and emotions have more to do with cancer than your genetic makeup. What an empowering thought. You are not bound by the precedent even of your genetic makeup. It all comes back to your belief system and how you handle it. He said, actually, stress is 90% of the reason why most people go to the doctor. It's stress is causing something in your life that is, or your body is, that is not working. So when we start changing those things, that's when we have the power of our biology using our beliefs. So believing... And beliefs are the, the crux of what we're talking about here today. We have so much power available to us. And Ernest Holmes taught us that again and again, that we have something within us that knows the wisdom of everything that is there. So believing is that first step. Then we have to move from believing to knowing. And did you know that those are two different things? 
Believing and knowing are two very different things. Believing is when I think that thought, I believe that thought. Knowing is what? When we practice it, when we actually get to practice it. And I know that in my own life, when I think I know something, something will happen in my life that I get to prove it. (laughs) Anyone else have ever had that experience? You get to prove it. It's like your final exam. I get to have my final exam. And so we have to move from taking our vitamin B, which is important, but now we're also moving to another vitamin that we have to take, and that is vitamin P for practice. Because we have to not only believe, we have to practice this. John Randolph Price wrote in A Spiritual Philosophy for the New World about a woman who attended one of his retreats. And she asked him, she pulled him aside, and she said, I I just need your help because I'm facing this challenge in my life, and I just don't know what to do about it. So he got some more information from her, and then he he shared with her what he thought would, you know, he that he that how he could help and, and uh, what she should do. And when he told her his answer, she said to him, I already know that. And he said in his book, as he wrote that, The truth is, if she really knew that, the challenge wouldn't have entered her life in the first place. See, we know if something shows up, it's simply a chance for us to prove that we know what we know. And so he goes on to say, maybe it's time to bring some humility into our lives and admit that we do not have all the answers. And maybe it's time to start practicing the truth that we so eagerly share with others so that we can be the teachers of wisdom that we were sent in to be. Here's the chance for us to really honor that knowledge and live it, and live it. Have you ever been with someone who, as you're sharing something, they immediately tell you what to do? And they're very willing to do that. What if we just prove these principles simply by living it? I once passed a church on a highway, and you know how churches many times have like little things that they can put little sayings out there, and this particular one had, preach at all times, use words if necessary, and I love that, because that's what we do, we, we encourage people to live these principles, we're not here to mouth them as much as we are to live them. As Ernest Holmes says, it's far easier to teach the truth than it is to practice it. And boy, truer words are never spoken. So practicing means that our beliefs can change. So remember how I shared that I was this reporter back in my earlier times. I knew early on that I came here to be a powerful communicator in this world. That was something that I just really enjoyed doing. What I found out was, because I thought it was to be a reporter and to be a news person, what I found was that that wasn't a good fit for me because I got tired of telling people negative things. I got tired of listening to a police scanner to find out where the next bank robbery was or the next fire was or whatever. That's basically what we did was we listened to a police scanner all day long. And I knew that that wasn't what I was here to do. So I had to refine my belief and move to a place that was a bigger, a bigger idea of that. And it's no accident that I became a minister because what I decided was my belief now is my purpose, my mission here is to be a powerful communicator of empowering ideas. And news people don't really get to do that very much. And so I had to shift and tweak that idea. And so I think that knowing our life purpose, knowing our uh, reason of being, what we came here to be, is so important that I've created a, a class. And in this class, we're going to actually explore this. And I have a little flyer somewhere. There it is. In July, I'll be offering, this is a shameless plug, by the way. I, <laughs> I'm offering this class. It's just a four-week class starting July 21st. So four consecutive Thursday nights. And it's called Align With Your Purpose and Create Your Sacred Contract. Because how many of us know that we're here to be on purpose but haven't really taken the time to dig deep about what that might be? So we're going to have exercises. It's going to be very experiential about how we can really dig in to find out what our life, mission, and purpose is. Would that not be helpful? 
And so once we discover that, then we're going to write a sacred contract. Has anyone ever seen Edwin Gaines? She's been here also. The first thing she says is, I am 100% committed to the prosperity of the planet. She's very clear on what her contract is with the divine. And so anything that comes into her life, if, her, if it does not support the contract that she has with the divine, she knows not to do it. And so once we determine what our, our specific life mission and purpose is, we're going to write a contract. You will write a contract with the divine. And so we're going to then have the capability to really, really understand that once we make that intention, everything that is not like it will come up for healing. Then our beliefs will be challenged, will they not? Because when we say, this is what I stand for, this is who I am, anything unlike that will get to come up for healing. This is our life mission, folks. We signed up to be ever-evolving beings. And so we're constantly in this circular upward motion if we're really doing our work. And that's what, what I know that really creates the empowered living that we all seek. So I invite you to pick up a flyer. They'll have a sign-up sheet in uh, probably next week or the week after that. So we are here to be empowered beings. I'm going to close with a story that actually you might have heard because it did go viral last week. And for those of you that might have seen this on Facebook, there was a story about JetBlue. Now JetBlue decided very quickly that they wanted to help the families of the victims in Orlando. So they offered free flights, which was a wonderful, wonderful gift. And they offered free flights to any relative that was going to Florida uh, for the memorial services, unfortunately. And so earlier in the week, there was a flight that was going to Florida. It was just a little over an hour and 15 minutes. But there were three flight attendants on there. This flight crew found out that one of the women sitting in the front of the plane was a grandmother of this young man. And his name... His name, if I can get to that sheet, his name is Luis Omar Ocasio Capo, beautiful young man who was killed that night in Orlando, and his grandmother was flying on JetBlue to attend his memorial service. So flight attendant Kelly Davis Carras ended up doing something that was far more meaningful than just giving her a pillow and a blanket and trying to make sure she was comfortable. She wanted to do more. So she conspired with her fellow flight attendants, and as they were pushing the beverage cart down and, and giving people drinks, they whispered to the fellow passengers and said, the woman up front is going to the funeral of her grandson. He was a victim in Orlando. Would you just write something on this, this piece of paper to let her know of your support? And she said, I envisioned that they would write their name and just some lovely thoughts about um, the kindness and, and love and how they supported her, you know, our thoughts and prayers are with you, that sort of thing. But she said what happened was amazing. People weren't just writing on it and giving it back. They were writing a whole page or a couple pages, and they were writing stories, and they were sharing from the deepest place within them how much they honored this woman and what she was going through. And so the love that was coming out of each of these passengers, every passenger on that plane wrote something. So as they, when they finished, the flight attendants gathered up all of these notes, which were now a huge stack. And she said, I thought I was just going to give her one sheet with a bunch of names and a couple of sentences on there, but I ended up giving her a stack of beautiful notes and kind letters that these people had written to this woman. Now then something really incredible happened. Because all of the you have, who have been on flights, everyone in this room knows that when you land, you touch down, people start unbuckling their seat belts and they're kind of jockeying for position to get up and get off that plane as quickly as they can. And when the ding goes off that says, okay, you can get up. People are like jumping up out of their seats and they're ready to go. But that didn't happen this time. When that ding went off, the flight attendant said, can we please have a moment of silence for those victims in Orlando? And they sat there for another full minute 
in silence. And after that, people got up and they walked not just off the plane, but they stopped where this grandmother was sitting. And they leaned down and they touched her shoulder or they gave her a hug and they said, we're so sorry. We're, we're, our hearts are with you. It was an incredibly touching moment, an outpouring of love that people had in the midst of a tragedy. And so the flight attendant shared this on Facebook because it wasn't just the grandmother that was touched that day, was it? It was every per- person who participated in that. Every person who said, wow, I am here to be a stand for love in the midst of something that's so horrific that we can't even comprehend how someone could do this. But I'm going to be a stand for love today. That's taking your vitamin P, my friends. That is moving from belief that love is the ultimate answer to everything and is the highest and best of all of us to practicing that love is a verb. It's not just a word. It's a verb in how we act and how we interact with each other. Dr. Michelle's theme this month, engaging, embracing, and empowering life. I can't think of a better way, can you? Those people on that flight engaged, embraced, and empowered life like nothing else. That's a wonderful example for, of all, uh, for us all. And that we can hold the belief that this universe is always conspiring from our good and that out of something that someone meant for harm, good, good, great good can come. So I'll close with my final quote from Joe Goldsmith. He said, live as a master and the power will be given you to be a master. That's the key. That's the key to live and practice these principles again and again and again until we embody them. That's who we are. That's how we live. Namaste. Let's just move for a moment in this sweet energy of love that Reverend Sally has so supported us in creating. Let's move into prayer and into a knowing, a deep knowing, not a belief, a knowing. That the one presence and the one power that we call God is the one presence and the one power that is love. Only love every other word or adjective that we might apply is just another way of saying love or an attribute of love. That is what God is and therefore that is what I am and therefore that is what every single one of us in this room is. Every single one of us in this city, state, region, country, world. We are each love. Whether it's completely covered up and unknown to us or whether we're pretty present to it most of the time. It is our truth. So in this moment, we deepen into that truth. We move from belief to knowing that that is so. And recognize that love, therefore is always and in all ways the answer to whatever the question is. This morning we simply embrace, enfold, and embody the idea of love. Of love in our lives, love in our world love for our highest dream, for the next iteration of our dream, love for those who may think their dreams have been shattered, but knowing there is always a divinely inspired next level. So I accept that for each of us here and for all humanity. 
The divine love is always wanting to express at a no, at a new level and that that is what we allow to happen. And as that occurs in each of us individually, we truly are like the pond or the the rock put in the pond, the ripple effect that goes out into the world. So I affirm and know for each of us here this morning, each who is hearing my words, whether it's in this room or online at the moment or later, that the love that is in our hearts, the love that is moving us forward to that next level of expansion and expression is what we listen to, is what we more than believe in, is what we know. And we trust that it moves us forward in that ever-evolving ever upward spiral of evolution and the results of this which we may have a picture of we may not at this point but we know that they are good we call it good because it is God so it must be good and then the calling of it good we celebrate that it is so with rejoicing and thanksgiving and in a state of rejoicing and thanksgiving we now simply let it go we let it be We let God be God as and through us. And we let love point the way. And as we let love point the way, as our beloved Ernest said, the law then makes the way possible. So we release to that law. We let it go. We let it go and we grow. We let it go and we trust. And to anchor that and confirm that together, we say, and so it is. Amen.